guys, welcome back to the channel. Hope you're doing really well. It can be really overwhelming once you've made a decision to build a home theatre to know exactly where to start. I know I found it extremely difficult to know all of the things that I needed to do and plan for and budget before I spent any money. So in this video, I'm going to give you a breakdown of some of the things that I learned on my home theatre journey. There's a lot to get through, so let's get into it. So now that we've decided we're going to build a home theatre, there's no turning back. The first thing that you need to do is analyse the space or the room that you're going to use for your home theatre. In most cases, it will either be repurposing an existing room or you may be building a house and then you have a little bit more flexibility when it comes to designing the room itself. The main things to look out for are the shape of the room, the dimensions, and whether or not you'll be able to put speakers in the ceiling as well as where you would place your chairs in relationship to the screen and also the projector. You'll need to do this so that you can determine the best possible viewing position. I highly advise that you draw a diagram of your room and then start placing the various things in that diagram so that you'll be able to see the relationship between the screen, the projector and also the things like the chairs and any other decorations that you might be putting in your room like posters and a concession stand. This overhead layout will really help you when it comes to deciding what things you're going to put into your home theatre and the choices that you make specifically. The most fun part in my opinion in designing a home theatre is choosing the speakers. In my other videos, you may have noticed that I've been saying a lot lately that the best speaker configuration that you can go with in the current era in 2020 is a 7.2.4 setup. That is that you have seven E-level speakers, you have two subwoofers and four overhead speakers for your overhead or Dolby Atmos channels. Going with a 7.2.4 setup gives you an amazing array of sound immersion. For the purpose of this video, I'm going to be referencing a 7.2.4 Dolby Atmos setup, so bear that in mind even if you are deciding to go with a DTSX or an Aura 3D setup. In my opinion, Dolby Atmos is a great platform to go for because it is a very recognizable and also a widely used format. So which speakers do you ultimately choose? This is a very subjective topic because there are a number of factors that determine which way you go. You have budget, looks, quality, the platform that you choose, which is if you decide to go with floor standing speakers, bookshelves or in walls, as well as the size of the room. When analysing your room, you might discover that you need to go with in walls because the dimensions of the room don't allow you to put things like tower speakers in because they may be blocked by things like open doorways or they may protrude above the screen. These are questions that you need to carefully consider before you decide on your speakers. Personally, I'm partial to Klipsch speakers and that is how I've kitted out my room. And in the States, they are quite affordable and you can buy them pretty much anywhere, even on the used market. So I'll leave links in the description below to some of my favorite clip speakers, so do consider checking those out if you're interested. For your front soundstage, it's really important to try and keep at least that in the same brand. And having even the same model of speakers will really help with having that consistency across the soundstage. If you have the same model across the soundstage, you'll find that you won't get as much roll off and you'll have a really nice consistent sound, especially if there is moving dialogue. At this stage of the home theater planning journey, it's just important to get something down so that you have somewhere to start. Don't go buying them just yet because you may find that you may change your mind by the time you get to the end of this journey, especially because the requirements of the room and the way that they impact these choices may occur. So the next thing that you need to do once you've decided your speakers and your speaker placement is to look at your wiring setup. What you need to do is figure out if you can run wires through the ceiling, through the walls, across the bottoms, underneath skirting boards or carpet. Your ability to do this will ultimately decide how and where you can place your speakers. If you aren't going to go through the walls which may contain power, you can generally wire things yourself. However, it is always recommended to use a qualified electrician to do this work for you. I recommend going with either a 14 or at minimum a 16 gauge wire and what you need to do is then you need to work out over the distance that you're going to run the wire from your speaker to your amplifier what the attenuation is because the further the speaker is away the thicker the wire you'll need to use. You'll only know that once you've checked the speakers. There is a graph that I can link you down below which can help you in determining which way to go when it comes to choosing your wiring. In most cases, thicker is always best. So you can go and buy some fairly inexpensive wire and just plate them up with using 
banana plugs. However, what I like to do is actually use PET sleeving, cover them, put nice gold-plated banana plugs. It doesn't improve the sound quality, but it does improve the looks. Home theaters require a lot of power. Now, it's understandable, especially if you have some big subwoofers, you're going to need to make sure that the circuit can handle it. My minimum recommendation for a home theater circuit is 20 amps. The reason I say that is because if you are running on the same circuit as anything else in your house, there is a high chance that when you've got the system cranked up that you could trip it. It'll be really inconvenient in the middle of a movie to get up and go and have to flick that circuit breaker. When it comes to running power, there's a few things that you need to consider. You need to work out where you're going to place your AV rack, where you're going to put your subwoofers, because at this stage of the game, you may not have decided to go with passive subwoofers. They may require power. So make sure that you do put power in the locations just to be on the safe side. While we're talking about power, it's also important to consider how you're going to protect your gear. In my case, I have purchased a UPS or an uninterruptible power supply. What this does is protects your gear from any power surges as well as keeping them going for a little while so that you can power them down gracefully. There is also the option of a power conditioner. And what a power conditioner does is it takes the power coming in and then distributes it in a very efficient manner to your gear. The differences between a UPS and a power conditioner, there are quite a few, but the main ones are that a UPS has a battery and it stores power and a power conditioner just distributes the power in a really clean way to your devices. It's advisable to get both, but if you're on a budget, I would recommend just getting a UPS as you can get them for a couple of hundred dollars and they will do a great job of protecting your gear. Lighting plays an incredibly important role in your home theater. You may think that just because you're going to be sitting in a dark room looking at the screen most of the time, that the lighting isn't important. Well, I can tell you that I made that mistake when designing my theater and it became a very costly exercise to run my lighting after I'd already built my room. I chose LifeX as my smart lighting platform and I'm really glad that I did because it is an amazing platform to work with. I have them synchronized with things like playback and pause and I generally, if I want to create a really nice ambience in this room, even if I just want to relax in here, it's limitless what I can do with my lighting and the type of mood and effects that I can create. Fiber optic star ceilings are a great way to add interest into the room. They look amazing and if you're interested, do consider subscribing to the channel because I'm actually working on my very own star ceiling right now. It's the biggest project that I've dealt with to date and getting it into this room is going to be a big challenge, but I'm up for it. So yes, consider subscribing if you're interested in seeing how it turns out. Right, now we're going to talk about projectors. Choosing a projector can be quite a hard task, especially when you don't know how it's going to look in your room. As you go through the checklist in this video, it might help to narrow down your choices. Things to consider are the brightness of the room, the color of the room, and whether or not there's going to be any light coming in, because if there is, you may need to go with a higher lumens projector. It also affects the screen and the choices that you make around your screen, but I will be covering that in the next segment. There are plenty of options to choose from when you're deciding on which projector to get. You can get 4K, E-Shift, 1080p, there's so many choices out there and all of them do have their place even in 2020. Personally, I have an Epson TW9300, which is an E-Shift 4K projector. It is really a 1080p projector that overlays multiple 1080p images simultaneously to give the effect of a 4K image. The best part about it is that it was really affordable compared to some of the 4K counterparts. Ultimately, the decision is going to be based around how far away you're going to have the projector from the screen because certain projectors can produce a maximum size at a shorter distance. So you may need to check on the calculator, which I will link below, where you can plug in the room dimensions as well as the projector model and the screen size, and it will tell you if it's gonna work. I will leave links to that down below. It's very difficult to give you an idea on how much to put aside for a projector because it is a really important part of the buying journey. The main thing is, do you want to be upgrading regularly or do you want to make a bigger purchase to help future-proof your investment? In my case, I wanted to get something in the middle of the road that would last me now and play 4K content but last me all the way up until when 8K becomes a new standard. I made a decision when I built this home theater that I wasn't going to upgrade my projector until 8K became the next standard. I will leave links down below to some of the projectors which I think are really suitable for buying in 2020. 
These will include offerings from ViewSonic, BenQ, Epson, JVC and Sony. So if you are interested, do consider checking those out down below. Next, we're gonna move on to home theater decor and that includes the home theater seating. When you go to choose your home theater seating, you need to consider the size of your room, which you would have done if you followed step one and analyzed your room. If your room is meant to blend in with the rest of your house, then you need to go with something that matches that decor. If you're like me, you have a dedicated room where you can close the door, you have a little bit more flexibility in what you can choose, especially if you wanna pass the wife test. The main thing to consider is how many you want and where you're gonna place them in the room. Ultimately, your speaker calibration will be to the main listening area, so you do have to think about that when you make your decision. There are a number of other things that you can put in your home theater. Things like a concession stand where you can have popcorn machines and fridges and little shelves where you can put candy and other things. Now, I personally don't have any of those things because I don't really need them. My kitchen's just over there and outside the room. And if I need to get something, it's really easy to go and get it. Um, I would have liked to have had a small section, but my theater is quite small. Do involve your partner when you're choosing the decor because often you'll find you need to get their approval if you want to stay married. For those single people out there, good luck to you. Do whatever you want. But for the married ones, I would highly advise Get your wife involved in the process, get her excited about it. I know my wife didn't care at all about my home theater, but once I started asking for her opinion on things, she started to weigh in and say, I think this carpet's better, I think these seats are nicer, and generally the whole process went a lot smoother. Right, now one of the biggest and most asked questions that I get when I tell anyone about my home theater is, how much did it cost? It's not an easy question to answer because if you're into this hobby already, or if you're considering going down this path, it's a never ending quest for perfection. So the easiest thing to do that I found, and I actually did this when I started to plan for my home theater, was I opened up a spreadsheet, I wrote down all of the things that I'm actually discussing in this video, pretty much everything that I could think of that I needed to put into my home theater, and then I went and researched each of those things and I wrote down the dollar values next to it. At this point, I didn't have an exact budget in mind because how long's a piece of string? You don't know what you don't know. And because I wasn't well versed on the subject of home theater, I didn't know how much I'd actually need to put aside. My wife thought that setting up my home theater would only cost me about $5,000. Now I knew that was definitely unrealistic and I had to tell her, look, the projector itself could cost about $5,000 and that doesn't cover speakers or anything else that goes into building the home theater. So. I find getting an Excel spreadsheet open and starting to itemize all of the various components that go into building a home theater is a great place to start. I'm not recommending that you go to any particular level when you do this because ultimately your budget will determine this. So you may have an unlimited budget and you could go for the latest and greatest 4K projectors and the highest end speaker system which could have cost fifty dollars to $100,000. I'm not aiming this video for those people because generally those people will get professionals in to build it all for them. This video is more aimed at the middle ground, people that might have a little bit of disposable income and they really want to have their own dedicated home theater. So I'm talking about spending decent money and getting good equipment but also trying to find bang for buck. My guide will work whether or not you want to spend only a couple of thousand dollars all the way up to higher end budgets. The beauty of it is you can pick and choose what you want to do. You may decide I'm going to spend all my money on my speakers and my projector and my seating and leave it at that and say okay well I can upgrade things later or I can add to my space as I go. There are still a lot of things left to do in this theater. I have made a decision that I will be going with in wall speakers for my front soundstage and I will probably repurpose my Klipsch RP150Ms and RP250Cs in another room but I am looking at going with the THX 8000L by Klipsch I think they will sound absolutely phenomenal in this room I can't put tower speakers because it's blocked by the doorway and will protrude above the screen so these 8000Ls look great I'm gonna have them with the grills off and show them off my, the rest of my system is all in walls, apart from my subwoofers. So I think that will be a really nice addition to my room. So this is an example of how you can easily blow your budget in the outset once you make decisions on which way you go. The next thing on the list is your screen. There are also a bunch of options when it comes to choosing a screen. You've got ambient light rejection, you have acoustically transparent, which means that sound can pass through the screen. And that's useful for when you want to put speakers behind the screen. You've also got things to consider like gain. And what gain is, is the ability for light to be reflected off the screen surface. The higher the gain, the brighter the image will be. 
but you will have an issue when it comes to your black levels if you choose a high gain screen. The darker the screen, the better. So it's also advisable to try and get the room as dark as possible because then your black levels will be really good. It's kind of a juggling act and that's why you have to sort of consider everything like the, the brightness of your room, the type of projector that you're using and the output that that projector will use and the screen itself and the gain of the screen. The other choice that you'll need to make when it comes to choosing a screen is the aspect ratio. And what that means is if you want to go with a CinemaScope screen or a 2.35 or 2.4 zero to one aspect ratio, which is what you're traditionally used to seeing when you go to the theater. A 16 by nine screen is basically what you're used to when you watch the TV. When you're in your theater, you need to make a decision about which aspect ratio you want to go. Because if you go for a CinemaScope screen, you will have bars on the left and right if you're watching 16 by nine content. If you go with a 16 by nine screen, you'll have bars on the top and the bottom instead of the side, which arguably is the better option of the two if you're planning to watch mixed content. At least with a 16 by nine screen, you will not be cropped on the sides and only the top and bottom. So you still feel like you're getting a big picture. If you have a CinemaScope screen, the cropping will happen on the left and right, which will make the picture look smaller. For me, I generally only watch movies in my theater. And that was a mistake that I made when I picked a 16 by nine screen because generally I do not waste the bulb life to watch TV shows in here. I'd rather save it for special occasions and blockbusters, which are always in the CinemaScope format. I will leave some links below to some screens, which I think are really good value and good options for you to consider. Next on the list is the AV rack. Now the AV rack is important because it will house all of your equipment such as amplifiers, receivers, servers, and any other media playback devices like Blu-ray players, Xbox, PlayStation, Roku, Fire Stick, and an Nvidia Shield or Apple TV, just to name a few things. This is probably also where you're gonna have all of your speaker wires terminated. Personally, I also have all of my networking equipment in this rack. So it is quite noisy and generates a lot of heat. So I have it in a different room in my house. So this is something that you may wish to consider when you're designing and building your home theater is locating the AV rack on the outside of the theater to avoid the heat and the sound that it makes. Home theaters are often sealed rooms. So when you have big equipment like that generating a lot of heat and also the projector which generates a lot of heat, the room can get quite hot. It's not always practical to do, but if you have that choice, it's something that I recommend that you consider. <laughs> Choosing your receiver should be one of the last things that you do because you don't know at this point how many speakers you're going to end up with. If you're restricted to a 5.1 setup, then buying a big receiver that can handle 13 channels is probably going to be overkill for you. If you do plan to upgrade over time and you do have pre-wire, then obviously go with a receiver that can handle the processing of more channels. As an example, I went with pretty much all Klipsch speakers bar two, and they are very sensitive speakers, so they're efficient in the way that they can turn a low amount of power into quite a big sound. And my receiver can process 11 channels. So it can't power 11, it can only power nine, but because I purchased a secondary amp, I was able to have it process all of the channels and just power the additional ones that I needed through the other amp. I could make a whole video just on picking a receiver for your setup, but just keep that in mind that it should be one of the last things that you do or pick when you're doing your setup because you don't know how many speakers you're going to end up with. Future me here, I just had to pause the video for a sec because while I was making this video and I was talking about receivers, I left out some very important information that I realized while I was editing the video and that was to talk about processing. It's really important to know what sound formats you'd like to have available. If you want Dolby Atmos, you need to make sure that your receiver supports Dolby Atmos. If you want DTSX, you gotta make sure it supports DTSX. Most receivers will support both, especially modern ones. So do consider checking out the specs of the receiver before you buy it. This was something that I overlooked while I was making this video and I probably should have put it in. So this is future me signing off. When it comes to watching media and content in your home theater, there are a bunch of options available to do that. You can cut the cord and go with streaming services. I actually made a video about this and I'll link it up here for you. If you're interested, check out that video when this one's finished. If you wanna get the absolute most out of your home theater, you will need to go with a physical media player. 
unless you're ripping Blu-ray or UHD discs in a lossless format so that there is literally no compression in the audio or video, then you will need to go with a disc. You will need to also choose a player that will play that level of detail. For example, the Panasonic UB9000 is a very highly rated UHD player and it can support Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos and will give you the absolute best quality when you're playing it back. You can also build your own private media library using Plex or Kodi servers and you can store and stream directly from your internal network. I'm not going to cover exactly how to do that in this video, but yeah, there are plenty of resources out there that will teach you. Right, we're on to the last point now, and that is acoustic treatment. This is something that definitely should not be overlooked. Making your own can be quite affordable. I made my own movie posters, I'll, I'll leave a link up here that you can check out after this video if you're interested in to learn how to make your own DIY movie poster acoustic panels. You can use very easily found materials to make your own acoustic panels and make them look pretty decent and they will do a fantastic job of improving the sound quality in your room. At the very least, you should consider sound absorption, but sound diffusers are also really good. I'm about to do a project where I build my own sound diffusers for my back wall. And so that what they do is they scatter the sound. So you do get a mix of absorption and scatter. So otherwise you may end up with a dead room. If you have too much absorption, you won't, it'll feel like you're in a, in a vacuum chamber. Try to get the best mix of both, depending on the size of your room. You will need to consider those things. Keep some budget aside, at least for four to six panels, uh, depending on the size of the room. So definitely keep some budget aside for that and do include that when you're planning overall your home theater. Righto guys, thanks for making it this far. If you liked the video, please smash the like button for me. This by no means is a complete or textbook guide to building a home theater, but I thought I would give you some information that would have helped me when I started, and it covers pretty much all the bases that you need when you're planning for a home theater. I would treat this video more as a guide for you to start investigating each of the things that I mentioned so that you can find the best things for your setup. I have left links in the description for most of the things that I mentioned in this video, more so to give you a guide and to help you out. I will be available to answer questions if you drop a comment down below. I do endeavor to read every single message. If you found the video helpful, please subscribe to the channel as there will be more videos like this coming and you'll catch me in the next video. Bye for now.